So, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, a view of musical rhythm <clears throat> as deadpan as you can make it uh, from, uh, from a mathematical point of view. Let's see how computational mathematics, that's my field, how it can inform uh, musical rhythm. And uh, the kinds of questions I've been involved in in the last 11 years are, are these kinds of questions. Uh, what mathematical properties make a good rhythm good? Um, well, we just heard a little bit about that. Um, does sub sub-Saharan African music possess hierarchical meter? Uh, do rhythms in Cuban traditional music come from West Africa? Do rhythms travel intact or do they mutate when they migrate due to cross-cultural blending? And if they mutate, how do they do so? Uh, where and how long ago did the clavecin rhythm originate? Does the flamenco music of Spain evolve from the fandango? Is the birthplace of the fandango the city of Huelva in Andalusia? Are the North Indian talas more complex than the West African rhythm timelines? These are some of the main issues I've been grappling with. I don't have time to talk about all of them, uh, but I'll mention three. Um, so previously, as you know, uh, these questions were, uh, so answers to these questions were sought mainly with non-mathematical uh, comparative techniques using history, biology, anthropology, sociology, uh, geography, psychology, neurology, all these things. Uh, I want to look at them just from the computational mathematical point of view. And uh, an advertisement, uh, this material is taken from my recent book that just came out in January. Okay, so the question, the first question, uh, what is rhythm? Well, that's one of the things that I hope we will all discuss a lot in the, in the breakout sessions. For my purpose, um, the, the Harvard de uh, definition of a specific rhythm is the most appropriate. Uh, that is a pattern configuration of attacks. Taking this further, I'm a computer scientist, uh, a pattern configuration of attacks for me is a binary sequence of zeros and ones. Um, where each uh, number represents a, a unit of time, and a one is a sound, and a zero is a silence. So that means we can, uh, we can describe a rhythm uh, by two numbers. The number of onsets, shall we say, or sounded pulses, these ones, and the number of, uh, of pulses in total, onsets plus silent pulses. Um, I'll use a lot of uh, notation, which is called box notation, uh, like this one here. And uh, this is the famous clavecin, which we heard just in a uh, clap earlier. And uh, also, uh, please ignore the, the names that, that I will use. Uh, for example, uh, most people call this rhythm the clavecin, uh, but in Ghana, it's the Panlogo bell time. Uh, many people believe it was uh, brought to, to Cuba from Ghana with the slaves. Uh, one of my big projects, which I'm not going to talk about today, is to do a phylogenetic analysis of the rhythms of the world, and I would like to find out exactly where uh, this rhythm originated, or maybe it originated in several places, and, and how it traveled. For example, uh, one of the things that I found is that uh, the earliest recorded history that I found of the Clavecin is in this book by Safi al-Din, 1252, lived in Baghdad. He survived the Mongol invasion. And uh, <clears throat> it's called al sagil al -Aval. And this is the, the notation. Uh, kind of, it starts from here and goes in a counterclockwise direction. Um, interestingly, they have another rhythm here, which is the first half of the clavecin twice, so the tresillo two times. Uh, anyway, um, the, I want to get to the first question, which is what mathematical properties of a musical rhythm make it a good rhythm? Uh, and is it possible to generate good musical rhythms algorithmically? So of course you can guess what my answer is going to be, uh, yes and yes. Um, so the simplest way, there are many ways to generate good rhythms, the simplest way I can think of, or maybe the most important, is the maximally even sets. And uh, interestingly, you can generate uh, a whole family of really, really good rhythms. How do we know they're good? Well, the definition of good is that they've been used in traditional cultures for, for hundreds, if not thousands of years. That's another definition of good. And uh, this goes back to the algorithm that you all learned in high school for uh, computing the greatest common denominator of two numbers. What are my two numbers? Well, the first number is the number of onsets, and the second number is the total number of pulses. 
So given two numbers, what is that famous algorithm? It comes from Euclid's book in Alexandria, uh, 300 BC. It says given two numbers, repeatedly subtract the smaller from the larger until zero is obtained. Uh, this is one of the oldest uh, al non-trivial algorithms that, uh, that uh, is still used today. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is the following. I'll, I'll give you an illustration with, uh, with the 12 uh, pulses and five onsets. And uh, so, for example, uh, you subtract five from 12, you get seven. Then you subtract uh, five from seven, you get two. Then you subtract two from five, you get three. Then you subtract... Uh, Two from three, you get two. Then you subtract two from three, you get one. If you get, if you get one, that means uh, one is the greatest common divisor. So that means the two numbers are relatively prime. Uh, there's no uh, uh, other divisors. So, uh, but how do we generate the rhythm? Well, we're not interested in the answer actually, whether the two numbers are relatively prime or not. We're interested in the history of the algorithm. So the history of the algorithm, you can write all the onsets here and all the silent pulses there and then do this this repeated subtraction and subtract this from here so just put it over there now there's two remainder put them at the bottom put them at the bottom here to get that now there's three remainder so take those two and put them at the bottom and keep doing that until there's a one column left over and now read these things from top to bottom and left to right and uh, and you get the, the rhythm right there okay so this is a famous African rhythm um, Here's other two famous examples. If you do it uh, with, uh, with, sorry, if you do it with n equals eight and k equals three, uh, you get the tresillo. If you do it with n equals eight and k equals five, you get the cinquillo, and so on. And there's a, if you do it with, with seven and 12, you get the standard pattern, which is uh, also called bembe in, in Cuba. Um, and you can find out a lot more about it in the paper by Kofi Agao there. Um, this pattern, as you know, is also um, the, uh, in the pitch domain. It's the diatonic scale, exactly the same pattern. And of course, there's this uh, isomorphism between rhythm and scales, which I hope is also a topic of discussion in the breakout sessions. And these are two good papers by Jeff Pressing and uh, Jay Ran uh, on this topic. There's a long list. Here's a short list to show you of, of the Euclidean rhythms, as I call them, because the Euclidean algorithm generates them. Um, and you can find those two numbers can be almost uh, anything, you know, 5, 11, 6, 13, seven, the list goes on. It's much longer than this. I'll just show you a few of them. 13, 24 for the Akapigmi rhythm. Um, so that generates good rhythms. But um, notice that for the given two numbers, this generates only one rhythm, right? But we know many good rhythms with five onsets and 16 pulses five onsets and 12 pulses. So it's, it's, it's a, little, a little limited. It's a little bit limited. We, we would like to generate more, not just one rhythm for each of these numbers, but a few more. Um, so how can we do that? Well, mathematically, we can, we can do it as follows. We can draw a rectangle of grid, a grid where, where the number of rows is equal to the number of onsets in the rhythm, and the number of columns is the number of pulses connect this point to that point over there. And you know, time is going in, uh, in uh, the vertical direction. So this is the, uh, uh, sorry, time is going in the horizontal direction and the number of pulses are, are going in the vertical direction. So if we look at the perfectly even rhythm would be the intersection points of this diagonal line with the horizontal line. But that would just be an isochronous dum, 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 right? So what we do, is uh, we snap them or round them, if you like, to their nearest neighbors. Because in a deadpan uh, rhythmic uh, performance, we can only play uh, notes at, at these, uh, these points. And uh, so you can see that, that the Euclidean rhythm is what you get, for example, if you, if you move all these arrows to the left intersection point. So you get the red points there, which uh, is three, 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 four. Okay, uh, that's the, the Euclidean rhythm. How can we generate more rhythms? Well, think of, of, of snapping these things to the left or to the right, so you have a choice. So you have two rhythms here, you have another choice there, another choice there, another choice there. If you do that, um, 
by the way, then, then you, you, if, you, if you were to snap all to the right, you get this 4, 3, 3, 3, 3, which is another bossa nova variant. Uh, if you do it to the left, you get this 3, 3, 3, 3, 4, which is uh, the most uh, popular rhythm in electronic dance music, right? Um, but if you do all of them, if you want to generate more rhythms, you can generate 16 rhythms uh, by, by, by making a choice. So there it is. You go to the left or to the right, to the left or to the right, uh, to the upper one or to the lower one. And this way, you can generate 16 rhythms. And these are the 16 rhythms. And so the question of which of these rhythms are, are used in the world and are good, um, they're shaded and, and listed. Uh, those are at least the ones I could find. But that doesn't mean the others are not good. Uh, they're just, for some reason, not, not, not played uh, in, in cultures. It's just like um, computers that play chess, right? They find moves and ways of playing that humans don't. That, that doesn't mean that they're, they're bad just because humans don't play chess that way. In fact, the computers defeat the grand masters. So they must be good in some sense. So these other rhythms could be good and, and can be used for, for composition. OK. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Seven minutes? Uh, OK. Let me um, speed up a little bit because I want to get to, to the third topic. The second topic is uh, does meter, uh, does mu African music, sub-Saharan African traditional music have meter or not? So there's a big debate about whether there is or not. I don't want to go into the details. Some people say, uh, most people <coughs> say, say no. Um, but uh, how can we test that mathematically? Well, the hierarchical meter is usually defined in this way with Lerda and Jackendorf. In other words, for each, say, in the 16 false rhythms, we have, we have a expectancy. We expect here most of the time, here second and third, and so on. So there's a hierarchy of expectancies or probabilities where you see onsets. So you can, well, so let's take uh, African uh, rhythm. Uh, here I collected a, a whole bunch of, uh, of famous timelines. And, uh, and, and we can just add up the histogram, and we, we get this histogram over there. Now, if you compare these two histograms visually, they look, they look rather different. But if you do a, a spearman rank correlation coefficient to, to test how close the hierarchies are, we, we get uh, an incredible 0.8 correlation. It's an extremely significant uh, number. If you start analyzing things more carefully, you know that one of the important characteristics of this is that it goes to, uh, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and the same thing is happening there. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, all the way. So this, this gives you mathematically, first of all, it tells you that, that yes, it has meter. Secondly, it tells you how much meter it has. And, and third, it tells you in what way. <coughs> and, and you can see that things are used much more often. If you compare with other kinds of music, like the Palestrina Paternoster, then, of course, you would expect uh, much higher, right? The correlation is uh, 0.786. And uh, if you were to, with the time and if you were to compare, say, German folk songs with African time lines, again, so looking at it this way, there's very close similarity between, between African music and, and other kinds of music. Uh, if you were to compare, of course, Pater Noster with German uh, or with GTM, you get even higher, right? 0.92, incredible <coughs> significance. And uh, the German folk song 0.97. So let me jump to the last topic that I want to talk about. And this is about uh, evolution, cross-cultural blending, and so on. So Rolando Perez Fernandez, this Cuban uh, musicologist, wrote this, uh, this book, The Binarization of African Ternary Rhythms in Latin America, um, where he claims that this uh, clave son uh, actually evolved from, from the fume fume, the, the, this, this uh, ternary version of the clave song. Now the two rhythms are, are quite similar, right? The first one goes but the clave song is definitely similar, right? Uh, now some musicologists like, like Kubik believe that this doesn't happen, that, that a rhythm either gets, uh, travels intact or it doesn't travel at all, that it doesn't get mutated. So can we check this uh, mathematically? Uh, well, if you were to stretch it like this so that the time takes, this, the, it takes the same amount of time by the clock, it's easy to compare them. 
Um, Rolando Perez Fernandez has all kinds of binarization uh, rules that he gets from musicology, and I don't have time to go all of them now, but we can do some in, in, in the breakout sessions. So he, he has for all the ternary rhythms what he believes are the correct binarizations. And uh, the question is, what can we, can we explain that with geometry? Well, with geometry, uh, there's four possibilities for uh, moving individual nodes, right? You can move, so the square is the binary and uh, the, the triangle is the ternary. So if we're binarizing, how can we convert the triangle to, a, to, the, to the square? Well, one way is by knowing the near, using the nearest neighbor rule, just connect these to the nearest neighbors in time. Uh, another rather strange one is furthest neighbors. And then there is clockwise rule, which is hesitation. And then there's counterclockwise rule, anticipation. Uh, see things earlier. Um, you might think furthest neighbor is very, very strange, but Logically, these are the four possibilities. And interestingly, many of the things that, that uh, Rolando Perez Fernandez has in his book actually use the, the furthest neighbor rule. He, in fact, here, furthest neighbor occurs more than, <coughs> than clockwise neighbor. Um, so interestingly, so th the question is, nearest is intuitive, right? And psychologically, Gestalt principles, they support this uh, hypothesis that, that you might uh, uh, across cultures, you might hear the ternary clavecin as a binary clavecin by just moving these nodes to their nearest binary counterparts. But it turns out that's not the case. So here you can see uh, that nearest doesn't give you a clavecin. Uh, it gives you instead 3, 2, 4, 3, 4. Um, furthest doesn't give you the clavecin. It gives you 2, 4, 4, 2, 4. Uh, rounding down uh, doesn't do that. It gives you two, three, four, three, four. So this anticipation. On the other hand, uh, rounding up. So round, rounding up means anticipating. That gives you the clavecin. So what do people do uh, psychologically? Do they do that, or or is there another model? And another possibility is that you're not locally moving the nodes to their nearest neighbors, but you're somehow doing a global uh, change, right? That all, all together you're, 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 you're transforming this thing. So the interesting question is, uh, if, if we go back to this, uh, this pattern here, here, right? Here we're, we're, we're putting them on the same time by the clock. So that means we need a clock with 48 hours, right? So that it divides 12 and 16. So let's put these things on the 48 hour clock here. And now we can see the difference between the, the, the binary and the, the ternary. The ternary is, is with the dotted lines, and the binary is with the, the, the other ones. And you can see exactly what is the relationship. They start and end, of course, at the same place. Uh, the first node is slightly off, 148, and the other two are 248s off. Um, and then it's interesting to see what happens. What are all the possible binarizations if you were to rotate this ternary uh, clave, uh, and, and, and at each instant of time, snap to, uh, to, to, to the nearest counterclockwise, clockwise, na na nearest neighbor, and, and so on. And it, it turns out that, first of all, I don't want to get into too much details, but rounding, if the nearest is the same thing as rounding a number that you increase by 0.5. So that means that, that the nearest actually is quite important, even though it didn't give uh, yield the clavecin that we, we saw earlier. But if you actually rotate all these uh, through all these infinite positions, you only get three possible binarizations uh, of, of the fume fume, the standard clavecin. And you can measure the global distance between all these uh, by different metrics, uh, either D1, D2, or D infinity. These are Minkowski metrics. Um, the, the one is just the, the sum of, of the differences, so zero plus one plus uh, one plus one plus zero. The two is the sum of those things squared, and the, the infinity is the maximum of all the possible deviations uh, of each uh, onset. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, if you look at, if you look at these, these metrics and, and try to find which is the closest, if you look at D1, uh, 
uh, D1 is 3, 4. 4 is the clavecin, and then it starts repeating here at 4. So that doesn't give you the minimum. D2 doesn't give you the minimum either, you can see, uh, because uh, the minimum is 1.7, and the clavecin is actually 2. So that doesn't work. And uh, you notice that the maximum metric is the same all the time. It doesn't even distinguish between, between all those binarizations. Um, so what is the story? Well, I think which model fits best um, will, in the end, have to be determined by psychological experiments. But if you use Occam's razor um, to select, then you should select the simpler first model, which means uh, things are, are, are snapped uh, to, the, to the nearest, but starting on, on any possible uh, position, or if you start on zero, it gets snapped in a counterclockwise direction, so uh, anticipation. Um, the second model, uh, which minimizes this overall distance of the whole rhythms, uh, has an awkward feature, right, that, uh, that you would have to listen to all of the whole thing before you perceive it. I don't think that's how people perceive things. I think they start immediately when the first node arrives. They already start making some, some prediction of what's going to happen. So uh, the first model uh, allows the listener to perceive anticipated uh, locations on the fly. So I believe this is the correct model. But we cannot settle it until we do uh, experiments with uh, human beings. And uh, that's it. <laughs>